gentlemen from the audience start talking about manufacturing in terms of our businesses in the neighborhood. And, you know, I'd like to see us, you know, at some point in time have more dialogue about what will, really will it take to bring more business back to, you know, inner city neighborhoods in particular. You know, and, and a lot of it gets down to having capital to invest, uh, be it uh, family capital, be it uh, institutional capital, whatever it is, to, to deal with some of the, the, the food deserts, some of the poverty, some of the crime. We've got to figure out how to kind of rev up this economic engine. You know, America is a great nation. We are, we are great people. We're smart people. But we've got to connect the dots and figure out how to bring businesses back to the community, how to employ people, how to build some more wealth in our community. Yeah. I would say, if I may add, I mean, sure. I think that the greatest challenge we have, whether it is in Chicago or anywhere else in the country, is if we can possibly strike a balance, you know, between making money like never before, because let's face it, wealth has been generated over the last three decades like never before in the history of humankind. But if we only care about profit making and we place, have no place for values, for community values, for community interest, then we're lost. And I think that the challenge is precisely how do we reconcile those two values if they can possibly be reconciled in a way that render healthy communities. Where'd the wealth go, though? Who got the wealth? That's oh, well, that's, that's an issue that we can talk all the afternoon about. We all know. We all know where the wealth they went. They have a no oh, yeah. policy. Well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know and, and the, the problem is that, you know, I've been, in, I've been down to 26 and Cal and, and some of the other courts many, many, too many times over the course of my 40 years. And our judges do a great job, most of them, in trying to, you know, you'll see them trying to figure out how do, we, how do we not send you back to jail? How do we not do that? But when you have somebody who, you know, as I said, who's got these felonies, who's been out there, who's got a family to feed maybe, or at least himself, can't get a job, uh, doesn't have health care, uh, doesn't have a place to live, uh, can't get around, no transportation. I mean, just, just name to stack them on, stack them on. It, uh, and I'm not saying that's a reason to go uh, rob somebody or do something like that. I'm just saying, unless we find that we can give jobs to people, I'd rather give a guy a job than have him climb through my bedroom window. Absolutely. And, uh, really and that's, I, I really feel that that's the way we all have to begin thinking. And until we do, we're going to be in trouble. But manufacturing now is you just don't, it's not like it was 50 years ago. Exactly. It requires education, it requires math, it requires technology. So. If we push, if they if they push themselves or allow themselves to be pushed out, or we push them out of grade schools and high schools, they still can't get into those jobs either. So it's a circular type thing. We have to figure out a, a balance with respect to not throwing away, not viewing kids as disposable. Right now, we're viewing kids as disposable. We're viewing people in the criminal justice system as disposable, and, and the systems are set up to treat them like that. And soon, those that are in charge start thinking about folks is being disposable. People are not disposable. I mean, uh, but that's, that's where we end up. It's a new slavery on every level. So we, we've got to have a whole new emancipation, money in the community, manufacturing, keep them in school, and, and get them, pass them through the situation so that we can end up with, 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 with another generation. I, we're not going to have another, another generation if we keep we'll going around. In many Lucent. ways, we've been talking about something so basic, so in front of our eyes that we don't see it. And it is about how do we really rebuild the concept of democracy. I mean, democracy is supposed to be about people's power. You know, that's how our government should be working. Clearly it's not. And I think it goes back to, yes, making sure that we all become more engaged individually and as a community. But it also goes back to taking a look at what is the public law body that backs or not, you know, these kinds of efforts. I mean, I remember just about a year and a half ago, the former CEO of Intel, now retired, actually wrote a great piece about how do you create a job. I mean, and believe me, it's not just about individual choices. It's about whether we can reconcile individual choices, community values, and of course, laws to back the kind of rebirth of manufacturing that would make sense for the globalized world in which we now live in. Sean and Luz, you both um, uh, are with a, a a foundation that does a lot of the work. Um, 
much of what government, when government programs went away many, many years ago, foundations had to step up and take over many of these programs. We just heard Dr. Adams talk about how many of them have closed, and I know shelters and uh, so many of others have just weren't able to sustain themselves. How <coughs> difficult is it? I know you, you have a, uh, an endowment, but for the average foundation, how difficult is it for them to remain viable? I think it's the bitter irony that, that during down times when uh, foundations, nonprofits are, are most necessary, uh, it's also the time that they, they wither on the vine. Uh, but, but going back to that piece, uh, there, there's a huge reciprocal relationship between economic capital and social capital. And there are things we can ad do to address that both on an individual level, uh, so the way we interact with each other, uh, do we work collectively to solve problems in our community, uh, do, do we, we grasp uh, the levers of democracy. And the other piece, getting back to, to your question, the, the nonprofit piece, we know communities that are economically healthy, communities where uh, employers want to locate, have a high density of nonprofits. So it's investing uh, in those nonprofits that serve the community. I think uh, that the media, and I want to speak you know, from my standpoint, television, newspapers, don't do a very good job in looking at what the real stories that affect us today should be on our first segment of the newscast, and on the front pages of our newspapers. Sure, we want to crime. Everybody wants to know that if there's a murder in their neighborhood, that that got attention. But there are some wonderful stories in our communities that we don't hear about. There are some kids doing great things in, in the Chicago public schools who we don't talk about. And I think the media has is skewed in how it approaches what we put on the air, what we put in our newspapers, and we're not looking at the bigger picture of the health issues that uh, you spoke about and the housing issues that you spoke about and uh, the incarceration issues that you all spoke about. These are the things that they don't want to cover because they're not flashy. And so I think we, you have to write news, but you have to write letters and emails to the television stations and the newspapers and demand that your stories in your community be covered. That's how you do it. You write the general managers, you write the publishers, and you affect television programs like this one so that we get to see more of these and less of the other. But the other way to do it? Again, you mentioned at the very beginning, the social media. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Social media I works. I think if we push hard from the end of social media, it's amazing how suddenly the more traditional media is picking up their stories from things that are becoming really dominant in social media. Social uh, let me, let me talk to um, right. uh, Akila once more now. Kids your age, we all, say that uh, that's all you guys are doing is this all the time. <laughs> and you do spend a lot of time doing this. But just as we just heard, you also, I presume, are talking about other things and uh, the, the latest record and, and those sorts of things. So do issues that concern you uh, get out on the Twitter? On, and, and do you tweet about those and things? Um. Yeah, stuff like that gets out, but that's not what everybody sees. Everybody just sees that she's stuck. oh, I just ate popcorn. But that's not the important stuff. Like, we just came back from Washington, D.C. on our Journey for Justice rise, and everybody tweeted, like, daily what happened during our days, and we did hashtag Journey for Justice. So we tried to get that trending. But when you go back to school, that's not what everybody's talking about. So that's not what the media and everybody sees unless you go in front of the camera and you say, we just went to Journey for Justice, but they're not checking the Twitters and the Facebooks for the hashtag Journey for Justice. Let's go to our audience for a question, please. Hi, my name is Levita Moore. Um, one of, a lot of the problems that plague our communities stem from education. Um, we mentioned financial literacy and educating the students, but after the students come back from learning about financial literacy and become financially literate or they know how to handle their funds and things like that, how do we get that information to the parents? Because a 16-year-old, we can tell a 16-year-old about stocks and bonds all day long, but when they go back to their parents, their parents are like, well, you need to go get this milk so that we can eat. How do we do that? 
There is a, a great school, and this principal since retired, Ruben Salazar. It's right across the street from Walter Payton. The first time I visited it, um, and it's predominantly, and, and they, had, they actually, because they don't have a school in their community in Pilsen, they bust all these kids in from Pilsen to practically division in Wells. And, and I remember going in the basement of this old school building, and there's a group of parents there huddled down in the basement. It almost looked like they'd been kidnapped and put there. Uh, but they were the parents of the children were down there learning English because most of them were non-English speakers. And the principal took the time and said, if the students see their parents learning, maybe they'll become better learners and they're going to have role models who are two floors beneath them studying just like they are. And so, uh, again, there's some great principals and teachers throughout the city who find innovative ways, who find the funding, who, who frankly do magic every day against all odds and figure out a way to reach the parents, reach their communities, reach their students. Uh, it doesn't happen enough. It's not universal. It's got to be more uh, institutionally uh, supported. But yes, that, that has to happen and, and bringing them into the schools and uh, there's some federal funding for for different programs of, of neighborhood uh, centers up, up um, north and around the city, but we need more of that. Now, Pepe, you had something you wanted to say? Yes. The uh, question was mm -hmm. as where wealth goes. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, it's clear it goes to maintain wars, foreign wars, to really give profit and tons, billions of dollars to the war machine, the Chinese and family, and and more that, and also to impose a democracy. That is the uh, so-called motive to have this war. That's where the wealth goes. It should go somewhere else to solve all of these problems that we have nationwide, but the billions of dollars that we are spending, plus the human casualties that are happening. And then we cry and, and pray for the good uh, being there, but we have to do that. And that's what Oscar says, we have to engage. We have to really give ourselves a voice because it's only 50% of the people vote, half Democratic and half Republican sort of, and, and it's been going that forever. And the other 50 totally disengaged, don't care because many reasons basically they know nothing is going to change. So again, wealth goes where it's not needed, goes to enrich the package of the war machine and the Wall Street bankers. Uh, quickly, Luz, we just have about 30 seconds. Well, I, I feel that communities of color have historically been excluded from the engines that can create wealth. And I mean, if you go back to the GI Bill when our um, men of color came back and didn't even qualify for the loans to even create capital. So our uh, vulnerable families are so fragile that we can't keep doing the same and expect different results. So at the Kellogg Foundation, for instance, we are committed to racial equity and we are committing to support, uh, supporting communities of color. So we have thought outside the box. We are doing mission-driven uh, mission investments and programming-related investments, and we take very much care that they go to communities of color and organizations led by people of color. All right, thank you, Luce. And that's, we are out of time. Let's just call this part one because there is so much more that uh, we can discuss on this and need to. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you so much to our panel for taking the time out of their lives to be with us, and thank you for being here.